More than 90% of people believe there is an afterlife. I faded out, like, from reality and... The next thing after that, I remember, was seeing myself on the emergency table, and they were working on me, trying to revive me. Being brought up this tunnel of light. I was feeling all this love and this acceptance. An hour later, the doctor came out, and she said she was fine. And out of nowhere, she just asked when she can see God again. Most people are raised to believe that we are born, we age, and then we die. It's the natural cycle of life to death. Easy to see and understand, but what do you believe happens after we die? This is where opinion splits. Some have spiritual practices or experiences that describe our afterlife. Some believe in what they can see, touch, and measure. But can your beliefs on the afterlife change? I wasn't sure until I heard of Dr. Eben Alexander, a neurosurgeon who went through a near-death experience in 2008. He was a man of science. He didn't believe in it. When I was younger, I thought a heaven and a loving God made sense. But through my academic neurosurgery career, um, I saw less and less that that could be the case. I started out in a primitive earthworm eye view, very coarse, unresponsive realm, which I think in retrospect was the best consciousness my brain could muster when it was soaking in pus and the neocortex, the human part of the brain, was being destroyed. But then I was rescued from that by a slowly spinning white light into a beautiful, ultra-real, idyllic valley uh, filled with life and uh, growing plants with butterflies, uh, sparkling pools of water, uh, angelic choirs up above emanating tremendous, awesome, and joy and beauty in these incredible anthems, chants, and hymns that came down from above and then ascended up beyond that into realms beyond all time and space. During his experience, he was taken to a heaven-like place where everything he thought he knew about neuroscience was proven wrong. Shortly after, he wrote the best-selling book titled Proof of Heaven. What I find fascinating about this particular near-death experience is Dr. Eben's scientific background. His understanding of the brain and the way he's able to expertly describe what happened to him. Hear it in his words. I woke up about 4.30 in the morning with severe back pain, headache, and then the next thing my family knew is I was uh, lapsed into general uh, uh, epileptic seizures. I was in uh, grand mal uh, status, uh, which meant I was just seizing and completely unconscious, and that's when they called the uh, EMTs, took me off to the Lynchburg General Hospital emergency room, um, and uh, did a lumbar puncture, out came thick white pus under pressure. My neurologic exam showed uh, devastation. The reality is I just went deep into coma, and it was a severe case of uh, E. coli bacterial meningitis, which is a real shocker because almost all cases of E. coli meningitis occur in newborns. It's very rare to encounter it beyond the age of three months. You know, how did this happen? Uh, and then I, I deteriorated through that week on three powerful antibiotics. They'd had me on a ventilator from the get-go. One of the unusual features of my near-death experience is that I was amnesic. I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life. I had no language, no words, no knowledge of Earth, this universe. It was a completely empty slate, and that's quite unusual for an NDE, but I think it was important in teaching me some of the deeper lessons. My brain was uh, shut down. There's something called the Glasgow Coma Scale that you use to measure coma. Anybody in this room would score a 15. That means they're doing great. If you're a corpse, you get a three. Anything below nine is deep coma. And uh, for the vast majority of that week in coma, I was around a six or seven, sometimes as low as a five. So I was in deep coma the whole time. They had CT and MRI scan data showing that all eight lobes of my brain were affected. No part was spared. And that's why to have an extraordinarily rich experience, far more real than anything I'd ever experienced in my life, completely violates everything I thought I knew about brain, mind, Because you need a conscious brain to experience... But no, you don't. The brain okay. is a filter. Its main function is actually to restrict consciousness down to this tiny little illusion of kind of self and non-self, you know, all the stuff out there, and a here and now. But uh, so much of that is really a fiction. Step over from this world into the next. What happened? Well, for me, that journey began in a very primitive, coarse, unresponsive realm. It was like being in dirty jello. I called it the earthworm's eye view. Uh, and I was there for a very long period of time. I'm sure I didn't have any kind of memory formation moment to moment. So it seemed to last forever. 
But the good news is it didn't. I was rescued by the slowly spinning pure white light with fine silvery and golden tendrils. And as it came towards me, I realized it came with a perfect musical melody. Not music heard with the ears, because in those realms, our awareness goes far beyond the limitations of physical eyes and ears and a physical brain. But the good news is that beautiful spinning white light up and up and opened up into a brilliant ultra real realm that I call the Gateway Valley. And that was filled with many earth-like features. It was a, a world of perfection and ideals. There was no death or decay anywhere. Um, beautiful lush plant life, flowers, buds on trees, blossoms, colors beyond the rainbow. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing among millions of butterflies, looping and spiraling in vast formations above this, this uh, gateway valley. And in that valley were thousands of beings dancing, lots of joy and merriment. And when I wrote it all up weeks later, I said these were souls. I knew there were souls between lives and that there was this incredible joy and merriment going on. And it was all being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs, pure uh, spiritual orbs of divine energy, these, uh, which, which I came to call angelic choirs when I had to put a, a label on them. But it was the anthems and chants and hymns that would thunder down from this beautiful chorus of angels above that was fueling this incredible festivity of uh, sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools and all of this joy and merriment, children playing and dogs jumping, so incredible your, your, happiness. Your senses are heightened and not contained and not Correct. confined. You gotta remember our brain and our, our, our uh, eyes and ears, they give us a very kind of uh, diluted down version of, of reality compared to that. There it's like drinking through a fire hose, an incredible uh, ocean of this uh, loving awareness. And for me, in that beautiful gateway valley realm on the wing of that butterfly, uh, my first awareness of the divine was a sense of a divine wind or a, uh, the breath of God, as I called it in some of my early writings, that blew through and it was amazing because even though the elements of the scene stayed the same, all of a sudden I realized the incredible power of that divine force, of that uh, causal force of an infinitely loving God. Uh, not a judging God, one of infinite love, of being home, of our spiritual essence, of the purity of our being. With, with comfort that really goes beyond any so, words. So you felt comforted. And that's why- You so, felt at peace. Absolutely, and that is such a beautiful lesson that comes not just from my near-death experience, but from near-death experiences yeah. across all cultures, all nations, going back several thousand years, the stories are always of this beautiful peace, like we are home. Mm. This incredible joy and oneness and that God force of pure, infinite love is so healing. Uh, the good news is you don't need a near-death experience to know this. It turns out that it didn't all happen in that gateway valley. That in fact the music from those angelic choirs provided portals to higher and higher levels all the way out to the core. And the core was infinite uh, inky blackness but filled to overflowing with that God force of love. And all in the setting of the entire material universe and lower spiritual realms having been shrunk down to this complex oversphere that was there as a source of, of, of lessons and teaching. Uh, but in that realm was this incredible oneness uh, with the divine, a sense that our very conscious awareness is directly connected. There's no separation between us and that God force. Of course, the God force is the pure love, yes. with absolute uh, unconditional love for all of creation. I wasn't alone. Mm. There was a beautiful young woman uh, beside me on the butterfly wing. And she never spoke a word, she didn't have to. She was dressed in the very same simple garb and yet beautiful colors of all those thousands of beings dancing down below. And she looked at me with her sparkling blue eyes and high cheekbones, a broad smile, soft brown hair framing her beautiful face with a look, a look of infinite love. And that to me was uh, the essence of the journey and I think the most important thing for me to bring back was how her awareness came into my mind. And of course, it wasn't his words when it happened, but when I put it all to words weeks later and writing it all up, the message was very simple. And the thing is, I knew her so well from her, her uh, mental, emotional connection with me in my mind. 
And yet, I realized, and this was especially haunting in the, in the months after my coma when I started reading thousands of near-death experiences and saw that there was always a guardian angel who was somebody very crucial in your life. And I remembered her so perfectly that I knew I'd never met her in my life. You know, that was the, the beautiful discovery four months uh, after my coma. And of course, there's that beautiful picture. That's exactly... So, so <laughs> oh, you didn't God. know who this was? No. You had I had no, no idea. Oh, and it, turned, it has to do with the fact that I, I had met my uh, birth family about a year before my coma. But the reality is they were still suffering from the loss of, of that, uh, that daughter. And so they didn't really want to talk about her too much. And, uh, uh, you know, what they did share was what a beautiful, angelic, loving soul that she was. Um, and, of course, I, I was quite sad as a brother who never got to meet her in this world. And that's why when my uh, birth sister, Kathy, um, she finally sent me a picture. And I received that picture about four months after my coma. And it turns out it was very important that at the same time, because I think I needed some opening in my awareness and in my mindset. At the same time, I was reading a beautiful story in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, uh, Life After Death. And in that, she tells the story of a 13-year-old girl who had a, a, you know, was in coma, very sick medically. Uh, and in this beautiful journey, she was welcomed to the heavenly realm by her brother. Mm. And he was uh, demonstrated to her that power of unconditional love and the beauty of, that, uh, of God in that realm. And then helped her make a decision to come back to this world. When she did, she was talking to her father about it. She said, but I don't understand. I don't have a brother. And he said, well, you did. But he died three months before you were born. So we never told you about him. And that's when I looked up at the picture that I just received the afternoon before and I collapsed on the ground and my heart pounds mm. and I, I can't, even now, every time I, I revisit this story, chills running up and down my spine because yes. of the beauty of that recognition uh, of that guardian angel. And all of a sudden I realized we were deeply connected. Uh, and in fact, it's like she was looking at me in the picture that you showed a few minutes ago as if to say, do you finally get it? Yeah. Well, yes, Betsy, I finally get it. Well, the doctors had estimated early in the week that I had about a 10% chance of living through it. After seven days in coma, um, with uh, you know just a horrible uh, medical picture in terms of prognosis, uh, they predicted that had gone down to a 2% chance of survival. But in that medical conference they held that Sunday morning, they recommended to the family stopping the antibiotics. And the reason for that as they thought there was no chance for my recovery. So when I did actually open my eyes on that Sunday morning, they were shocked. Uh, I didn't, my brain was so completely savaged by this experience, I had no idea who these beings were standing at my bedside. My sisters, my sons, uh, my former spouse, my mother, I didn't know who they were. All I remembered was where I'd been, this incredibly rich journey. Uh, and I also had, for about 36 hours after I, I came back to life and they pulled out the breathing tube, I was kind of in and out of a crazy, paranoid, delusional ICU psychosis, a nightmare, uh, back and forth in that world. But the memories from deep coma, in many ways, were far more real, vibrant, and alive uh, than any of the rest of it. And that paranoid, delusional nightmare, those memories faded within about a week. The memories from the deep coma experience are as fresh today as if they happened yesterday. Oh, goodness. You know, when millions and millions of people start sharing these stories, yes. there is no doubt yes. of the eternity of soul and the, and the reality of this God.